Uh, well, thank you for coming. Um, I presented here, well, not exactly here, but another Tickle conference in 2019. And what's amazing is 13,000 people watched a video about coffee and Tickle, and, uh, which is really surprised me that that many people were interested. Uh, and so if you want to know the background for the project, I'd recommend you watch the video. I'm not going to cover the same ground today. Instead, we're now four years after that. Very quickly, what is this? This is an espresso machine that uh, we built from scratch, and there are about 8,500 of these machines now outside in the world. And the main reason that we built it um, is because the world of espresso was pre-scientific. And what I mean by that is that people making coffee didn't have theories that were testable and then experiments and revise those theories. It was all intuition-based. And, um, and those intuitions led to people hardwiring single-use machines like this one. And so the thing to do was to build essentially a computer that happens to make coffee. Uh, we call it a Turing complete espresso machine because it can do any pressure, any flow, any temperature. And the, the fundamental difference was this was a machine that was incomplete when launched, meaning it needed software, it needed to be told what to do. It didn't know what to do. And uh, what we really needed were sensors that didn't lie. And so we had to build the whole machine much as a, as a piece of scientific equipment. And so for me, Tickle TK was a natural as the uh, programming platform since the birth of the language was really to hook up to scientific equipment and display that data. And here we are with a sensor. This is uh, from a YouTube. Um, oh, I forgot to mention from the beginning, this whole presentation is available at decentespresso.com slash doc slash so you can get it from there. Uh, and this is all Creative Commons licensed. And so here we are calibrating what the sensor is saying. You can't see it, it's too dark there. And this is a very early version of the TK app running on Androwish seven years ago. I mentioned the machine was incomplete, and I knew that this project would have three life cycles. The first one would be it's a computer that makes espresso, but it needs software. What, what should it do? How should it make coffee? And I knew that in the meantime, we had to sell it to some people. I sold it as a machine that emulated the past. But really, the, the start of this project was to encourage coffee scientists, people with technical backgrounds, to program the machine to have new ways of making coffee. To that end, I first made a quite simple editor Looking at the past, I simplified it to three steps, and then you could change your flow, your temperature, your pressure. And that lasted about, I'd say, two years before the programmers said, we need a lot more flexibility. And so then a multi-step visual editor came out with some conditionals. You can say, move on if certain things happen. And the, the way we designed this was to be able to do everything that existed already. What we didn't entirely forecast is that researchers would start coming out with theories of new things. But nonetheless, think of this as a visual programming environment for making coffee. As people started doing things with the machine, or in other words, they started creating new programs for it, um, I was communicating that this was, espresso was actually difficult. Everyone else is saying it's easy, you just buy it, you press a button. It's actually quite difficult. and. About half the problem is the technology, the other half is human. It's, it's getting people to talk about best practices, their learnings, uh, and just show some of the things we did to try and attack those problems. So one is every person who bought the machine would be on a forum using a software called Basecamp, which assumes com uh, complete trust in everyone. So everyone has total access to moderate, to ping, to do anything, add files. That has about 5,500 active users on it, which is a quite busy forum. Then some researchers, this is a researcher in France named Stéphane Ribes. He, for example, made this spreadsheet that would generate programs. So instead of using the thing that I did, since it was an open format, um, he would generate it here. 
This thing on the top right is a cloud service called Visualizer. Since the app was open, uh, he built a cloud service where every espresso that was made on a machine would be uploaded to the cloud, uh, could be seen later. But one of the things I did with every espresso is I saved the complete state of all variables. So every espresso is essentially a VM copy. So if I make a coffee that's good, someone else can look at it, download the entire VM, and recreate the entire state of the machine as it was before. And then if the curves that result, meaning the coffee was set up more or less the same, are similar, the taste will be the same. And I'd say that sharing is probably what led to the quickest development of, of progress as um, in March, the one millionth espresso was uploaded to this website, which is quite a lot of coffee. And in the previous screen, like if you look at the top right there, this is meant to be the data honestly, uh, simply presented. Because I didn't know how the machine should be used, my user interface theory was that we should just show the data really what happened with minimal interpretation, really no, no processing at all. There's a little bit of processing showing you, for example, there's labels there showing you the weight in the cup at each point. Those are pressure, flow lines, but really very minimal. What that meant, though, is there was no knowledge of what might work in coffee. It was very much a scientist approaching every coffee, deciding what should happen. Um, and I had made the app so it was open source. It's on GitHub. And I hadn't really thought through just how much people wanted to change. One of the things that came out is people wanted to start making user interfaces, this is one, that were specific to one style of coffee. Okay, so previously I had generic user interfaces. This thing here, Dflow, this guy had a, a, an old machine, a lever machine called Londinium, and he wanted to emulate it. And so he came out with these interfaces these, these parameters here that are specific to this profile. And this spoke a lot to people to be able to translate what was originally very coder thinking, right? Uh, really about uh, the, the, the pressure, the flow, the temperature, and you really have to know a lot of coffee theory into something that was more familiar to people coming from that background. And really the communications were a real key to making this successful. And then the second period, as all those programmers and coffee geniuses were making things, um, we started to see patterns as to what worked, and some papers started coming out. So this was one I did. Um, we started simplifying the results from various things. And the last stage, which is the last several years, I call it tolerance for imperfection, because when you come out in the morning in your bathrobe and you're just kind of wandering towards this thing to make coffee, you're not at your best. And, and so while the coffee geniuses might know how to make the ultimate perfect coffee if everything is perfect, things rarely are. And what was most interesting to me, these are three different programs, essentially, for making coffee. And these charts here show you a visual representation. And each three of these try to deal with things going wrong. Maybe the coffee beans are stale, maybe you didn't put enough in, maybe you screwed up here. And what's interesting to me is, if you look at the chart, you can see they're all completely different. And this polyphony of approaches was probably the, the most interesting. It's really what I wanted to have happen. I really didn't want to be a dictator telling people my way is the right way. So here's the user interface that I wrote using Android Wish. Um, it's distributed on a number of platforms and screens. However, uh, because we are Bluetooth-based currently, it only really works fully on Android. And that's something that we're trying to address. I'll talk about that a little later. The user interface that comes with TK is not very familiar to what you'd want on a tablet. And one of, the, um, uh, one of the customers of the machine decided to write a widgets library. Now, everything I'm describing here is open source. Uh, I'm giving URLs here. So this is on GitHub. It's a very extensive user interface uh, widget library. And what's nice about it is it makes widgets that are quite tablet friendly. 
So if you see this app version, stable beta nightly, the uh, sliders back and forth. And it's funny how little things like that really make people um, less angry, I guess, about Tickle TK. If it looks like an app should. And one of the nice things about mobile apps or tablet apps is there aren't real widget standards. There's kind of families of standards. So as long as you feel right, it's OK. It's quite dark on the screen. Uh, maybe you can't tell. This is a latest one that came out. And um, this was in collaboration with a designer. I didn't write this. But it's quite beautiful what he's doing with that. And it's, it's all TK. It's all Android-ish. App extensions were something I put in at the very beginning as well, because my theory of open source collaboration is that it's most productive when someone can spend an evening or even a weekend to make a contribution. Asking someone to write a brand new app or to spend several weeks doesn't happen very often. And so these are extremely short, it's a few hours of work. A keyboard control, so you can tap on the keyboard to control the machine, uploading to Visualizer, and there's about 30 of these plugins. And always with Tickle, the goal is to provide an example and to make it as simple as possible. Um, I'd say the app extensions are a little more complicated than I'd like because they are able to hook into various things. The idea is maybe you want to do something after Nespresso is made or before it's made. And so here at the very top, I'm showing you some code to the sample one. There's some variables that define the extension. So it's visible. It can be loaded. Uh, it can be explained to people. Then there's a hook at loading. And then there's a main function, which is actually how it uh, loads itself up. Now, I should mention, this was actually not done by me at all. This was um, uh, who has become the open source manager, a woman named Joanna in Berlin who made the app extension example. And I guess one of the things that's interesting, difficult, about going to a, a proper open source um, environment where many people are collaborating is different coding styles, different approaches come in. She's a much more, I guess, real computer scientist than I am. She's worked for Amazon uh, for many years. And, uh, and so there's more structure, more, more uh, object-orientedness than I would do. I also made it so that people could write their own, what I call skins. But really, the entire app was written on the uh, language inside a language model, which is to say that the user interface is only about 10% of the code. 90% of the code is all the stuff behind. Uh, for example, this was written in a weekend. It's a user interface optimized for cafes. Uh, once again, it's Joanne in Berlin. This is a guy in Australia who's done a super geeky one, adding all sorts of power features. This one here was done by someone in the UK who specializes in user interfaces for severely disabled people. So he has a very different focus. And uh, so you can kind of compare the extension mechanism versus the skin mechanism. The skin mechanism is something I did. And it has much less oop, and it's much, much shorter. Um, but the main thing I did that I found really helpful was making um, uh, user interface objects appear and disappear automatically for you, so you didn't have to maintain state. So as long as you define pages like Steam, Espresso, Water, we're adding a bit of text at these locations, and then this is all TK here. And basically, I'm hiding showing. So as you tap away on the tablet, things appear and disappear, and they're managed for you. That removed most of the complexity for programmers. I have a few extensions that I added to TK. I don't think they're very elegant, but they do work. Um, so one was um, essentially a bound variable, because some things on the screen are changing. And so adding a D1 variable is just a text string. And there's a text variable thing I've added on the end, which is a bit of code which essentially says, when we're idle, can you run this code and refresh the screen? And also a mechanism for adding any widget that uh, TK offers. Here, I'm using a BLT graph. Okay. Updating over the air, you, you read in the news about major manufacturers having problems, bricking machines, things that don't work. Turns out, over the air updates 
take a lot of work in the real world. Um, you have things like firewalls, uh, you have sensors, you have advertisers, uh, you have other people doing bad things, and um, that, I would say, I started with HTTP, and, and that was a real mistake because stuff started getting injected. When I went to HTTPS, that was better, but then certain nation states would still interfere with HTTPS. Uh, and in the end, I ended up gzipping everything and putting a fake extension on the end so that the nation states don't know that it's a gzip. They just see binary stuff. Uh, and, and that has mostly worked, but there's still cases where we ask people to do a phone hotspot because their Wi-Fi is just actively preventing things they don't know. Uh, this, by the way, is essentially a funny t-shirt people have because, as you might notice here, we have nightly, beta, and main. With so many programmers on the project, it's not unusual to have several updates a day going on to the app. And so one of the funny t-shirts was Decent Espresso update one of 962, um, all to make coffee. Everything is labeled through Git. So the way that these, up here it says app version, stable, beta, and nightly, these are just uh, Git tags. So this allows us to not only have three different app versions, which are just essentially HTTP endpoints, um, but to maintain them. So if bugs happen, we can apply them back this way. And quite simply, uh, each file has a hash, and when you download an update, it downloads a hash list, and every file that's changed gets downloaded. This allows you to go to, for example, a beta or a nightly version, and then if you don't like it, back again. There is a quite ugly, very, very minimal app, which is the Cloud Update app, which is if I break this, like if I put a typo somewhere, you ran the app and it just crashed, then suddenly you wouldn't be able to do this update mechanism. So I've got a separate app, which is the world's simplest TK app, it's 20 lines of code, which just reverts things back to, to where they were. Um, that helped me sleep at night because there were a few times where I broke the update mechanism, and at that point, I'd have to essentially zoom in with people, have them command typing with Android Wish, and that was no good. Um, but I'm not sure the beta is that necessary. Really, there's two communities, people who want bleeding edge and people who want stable. The release cycles typically, virtually daily, there's a nightly update, and typically every six months, there's a major update. All right, so some challenges um, with the app. So one is shipping the same app everywhere. And the biggest problem really has been Bluetooth, that uh, I managed to get Bluetooth reliable on Android, and each Android version is, is itself a different Bluetooth, which is a lot of fun. Um, but for various regulatory compliance reasons, we were told we had to use Bluetooth and not Wi-Fi um, or USB. And, um, and I guess that's hurt us because it means we can't really run the same app on Windows and Linux and still control the app. And I would say that the fact that we're developing on Android on a desktop is probably the single biggest thing people hate about using Tickle because they're coming from IDEs and there's no way to really remotely uh, put breakpoints in when your app is running on Android. I personally develop on my Mac, and I have a, essentially a fake espresso machine that's running locally, it puts fake data in, but that's nowhere near as good as actually working with the machine. Um, we, uh, so Christian added a feature that's quite cool to Android Wish, which is you can run the app, and instead of rendering to the screen, it renders to an MP4 stream over HTTP. And what this means is you can take any TK app that's running under Android Wish and see it in your web browser. And it works really well. I mean, the latency is quite good. I'd say it's probably in the five to seven hertz range, which is really impressive. The only issue I've found with it is that the uh, keyboard tends not to work. So in other words, if you type on a text field, the MP4 and the, the local keyboard doesn't work. To fix that isn't a big deal. We just will have to make TK screen keyboards. But um, what we're going to do sometime this year is have a little dongle that's running um, a very small Linux computer 
that will then host the app running and do it as an MP4 stream. And we've written the world's simplest iPhone app that just opens Safari full screen, scans, finds the machine running the MP4 stream, and then connects to it. So this gives the feeling of having a native iOS app without losing all the freedoms. Because not only is the app open source, but the profiles to make Espresso, they're uh, a combination of data from Tickle and code. So that would be totally forbidden by Apple. The skins are code. They would be forbidden. The extensions are downloaded online. They would be forbidden. And this openness, the fact that the machine ships with a tablet and the code is there, and you can just change one line and see it live, is really what's propelled things. If I gave people a massive Swift project they could download, and then they had to compile it and convert it over, there'd be much less open source participation. So I'm, I'm quite interested in this MP4 approach because it allows me to still work inside walled gardens, uh, but not accept the terms that they have. So the kind of people who embrace Tickle is quite interesting. I would say it was mostly people who already knew several languages and were not fanboys of something new. Uh, and they just looked at it as, well, I can learn it in a day, and off I go. And they would program in their style. So you would see Python-ish Tickle or C-ish Tickle, which is kind of what I write. Um, and, and that was fine, and it was kind of the language no one liked, and so that was fine. But other people, especially people who are maybe using a more uh, modern language, like a framework from Facebook, or they absolutely insist on using Python, uh, would just absolutely hate it. And hate it like, actually make it personal. Hate me too, for having chosen this. Uh, and uh, some of them were really good programmers. And I was upset that one of the people who really improved the Bluetooth stack for me ended up leaving and doing his own Python thing. But what, ex what I expected to happen and did happen is he did extremely good work in Python that then no one else took up because just as many people hate Python as hate Tickle. <laughs> um, and so he's got really great work that doesn't seem to go anywhere. And I think picking a neutral thing that's easy to learn is, is not a bad idea. Um, so moving from open source to many people was, was really difficult. Initially, it was on GitHub, but I was doing all the contributions. And then we moved to someone else being the community manager. And I'm the main programmer, but other people bring it in too. Two things happened. Uh, one, I would say some of the tough bugs that I wasn't very good at, especially stuff to do with binary um, or communications, other people decide to fix but they would make design decisions. So for example, I might have something that deals with tapping a scale, and they would look at it and go, it doesn't work right, I'm deleting it. And I'll bring it back if and when I, I can make it work right. That's quite challenging, as well as people, uh, a lot of programmers like to add features, and someone says, oh, if I can add this feature, I can add this feature, and suddenly the user interface is just all these features. Um, also, the added complexity of other people started bringing in some subtle bugs because the app is quite large. On the other hand, uh, so I used to be chairman of the Electronic Frontier Foundation and work for Creative Commons, and I'm very, very committed to not telling you what to do. So the freedom that people uh, had to both improve and screw things up was something I kind of had to emotionally deal with. <laughs> and, and uh, figure out a way to, to um, reconcile. And what we would say is never know, but make it your own skin that someone has to load so that the core app doesn't start to break or become overly complexified. Uh, and generally what we do is we have them start their own GitHub project and then we link to them. So they post to us and tell us when to send stuff up. Different resolutions, tablets, Android versions, you can probably imagine, uh, while Android Wish hides some of that, um, it's kind of widespread and there's way too much conditional code in there, but that's just reality. 
but I would say it works. Everything's based on the 2560 by 1600 resolution, and then I just resize everything to, to that. Finally, right to left languages. Um, before, so we're based in Hong Kong, that's where uh, Bugs and I live, and we're very, very neutral in terms of who we sell to. What I mean is I don't play politics. Uh, a personal goal for this project was so many people around the world like coffee, can we just discuss coffee as a way to have common ground to get along? Um, and, and so supporting Hebrew and Arabic were things I absolutely wanted to do. And both those audiences drink a lot of coffee. Uh, and uh, so the way I ended up doing it is using a Google spreadsheet, which lists all the text strings. And then every uh, language is a column. And then there's a whole community of volunteers that keep the translations up to date. The right to left languages are especially challenging because due to bugs in either, it's hard to tell where, Maybe TK, maybe Android, maybe the text renderer in different platforms. Sometimes you need to flip the characters, sometimes you don't. So I'll give you an example. In TK, I need to flip the characters, but if I do a toast, which is a pop-up message, I need to not flip the characters in right to left. So for right to left languages, I have two versions, flipped and not flipped, of each thing. Um, and unfortunately, the bug is so subtle that there isn't um, code that will do the flipping for you uh, perfectly. So there's some websites. It turns out Photoshop has the same bug, which is really handy because people have made websites on how to do Hebrew and Arabic in Photoshop, uh, and we copy and paste. So some um, surprises. Because people said, you made such a horrible choice in choosing Tickle, of course we shipped, which is it's hard to argue against shipping, because when I first started this project, I really wanted to use JavaScript, but JavaScript's Bluetooth support was terrible. Um, I've been told in the last year it's gotten much better. I kind of feel like after 10 years of it being quite good, maybe I'll consider it, uh, because I don't really like fighting technologies that's only recently started working. And one of the things besides Bluetooth, so I couldn't use JavaScript because the Bluetooth just doesn't work reliably. Um, another thing that was surprising is I'm not sure why all the charting libraries in, in uh, JavaScript are so slow at rendering. So I made a decision when the charts, when an espresso happens, it does a real-time um, X and Y scale update. So the chart starts moving very quickly, and it's dynamic, and it's exciting. But People have tried to do the same thing in JavaScript, and it, they just can't do more than a 2 hertz refresh rate. Um, and we're at 10 hertz in Tickle on a 50 US dollar tablet, which is really impressive. And it's really thanks to BLT. Um, I mean, BLT with its C bindings is just really crazy fast. Um, and so all the other apps have this chart that's empty, and it just kind of slowly crawls and fills. And it's, first of all, what you're looking at is tiny, and secondly, there's no drama. And I was just surprised how uh, Tickle was able to do that really well. The uh, Bluetooth is an issue, and there, is, um, there are some Bluetooth features. For example, larger packets. We're limited to essentially 10 hertz. I think it's 16 bytes per packet. So we're looking at 160 bytes per second, to give you an idea of how slow that is. That's really challenging for things like firmware updates, which takes 45 seconds currently. 45 minutes, sorry. Um, whereas other languages like Python have far superior Bluetooth that can do variable packet sizes for faster updates. Um, so the future for us. So Python, JavaScript, there's, there's competing ones. There's an iOS app that was re recently uh, written, as I said, as a Python framework. One thing, just to be really honest to a group of, of ticklers, I'd say initially tickle was less of a barrier, but as we got bigger, a whole chorus of people saying, this is the wrong direction, we shouldn't go in this direction, we need to have a modern framework, John needs to abandon this, um, has gotten bigger and they created their own forum to, um, to do that work and also to continue that voice. And what that's done is there have been fewer, over the last few years, people 
doing or jumping into doing more tickle stuff. So the people for the first few years who did tickle stuff are still working away and doing really nice work. But the new people are saying, well, why learn tickle when clearly we're going to move to something new soon? And, and I have to listen to those people. And so my intention uh, is what we've done is we've written a proxy that converts Bluetooth to WebSockets. And then what I'm doing is porting the app to JavaScript so that you can then use JavaScript with WebSockets to um, do the app. And because Tickle runs HTTP servers just fine, I can host that. I don't really know where that's going to go. And I'm kind of interested. I was just looking um, at the Andrewish website, and I saw that there's some integration with JavaScript charting libraries. So if there were ways for me to integrate JavaScript code functionality into Tickle, that would help me accommodate both communities. Now, ironically, everybody who is going to program in JavaScript all say it's their most hated language. No one says they prefer JavaScript. Some people will say you have to use TypeScript or CoffeeScript or some other variant. I, I just don't want to go down that path of making uh, decisions of recent technology. I want to, just like Tickle as a choice, want to use technologies that are um, known by many people. So uh, cloud integration is something that's coming quite soon. I'll show that in a second. Uh, two apps at once. If you take a tablet, tilt it sideways. What I'd like to do is make espresso here, take your order here, and iOS there. And this is my last slide. Uh, so Gustav asked me, what about NaviServer? So about a third of my time is spent on the tablet app. Two thirds of my time is spent on NaviServer and running the whole company. So we're about 40 people now. And almost everyone in the company who's not building a machine is spending their entire day on NaviServer page. And so there's customer administration, there's uh, potential customers customizing machines, there's the accounting group, um, and I've integrated deeply with the QuickBooks API, the tech support customer service people, um, real-time inventory so you can buy the last things. Here's internal staff metrics, I'm working with the APIs with FedEx and UPS to see how long it takes, really, for each country, for each package. And um, the boxing team and all that and making shipping labels all happens through Tickle and APIs as well. So for me, this is just crazy how smooth things run and how easy the programming is. Um, I'd say thank you to the NaviServer team for making the back office run, and it's just one programmer working part-time. So that's my presentation. <laughs>